Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Jessica Foley, Chief Scientific Officer of the Focused Ultrasound Foundation. I'd like to welcome all of you, those online and here in person, to today's presentation on research progress in Parkinson's disease and the role for focused ultrasound. A quick note for those on the webinar, if you'd like to ask Dr. Fishman a question, please submit it via the chat function at any time during the presentation. We will collect these questions until the Q&A period begins at the end of the presentation, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can during the time that we have. I'd like to introduce Dr. Paul Fishman, Professor of Neurology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and Chief of Neurology for the Maryland VA Health Care System. His primary research interests include the development of new therapeutics for Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, and related neurodegenerative diseases and movement disorders. He's very active in focused ultrasound research with exciting preclinical work using focused ultrasound for enhanced delivery of stem cells in the brain and clinical efforts in focused ultrasound treatment of movement disorders. Today, he will discuss gaps in current therapies for Parkinson's and the potential role focused ultrasound could play in treating this disease. Dr. Fishman, take it away. Thank you, Jessica. And I, and I want to thank uh, the foundation for this invitation. Uh, it really gives me a chance to talk about two uh, of the topics I feel most strongly and passionately about. And, you know, the, the first is Parkinson's disease. Uh, and next year will actually be the 200th anniversary of the original description by James Parkinson's of this disease. And a lot of his original observations are still true. Uh, it is a uh, unrecognized and incredibly common uh, disease. Uh, among the neurodegenerative diseases, second only to Alzheimer's disease, with about a million patients in the United, uh, United States affected. Uh, average onset is in the late 50s, but at least 10% of patients have onset uh, at age 40 or below. Uh, and again, since Parkinson's disease actually doesn't affect life expectancy all that much, we wind up accumulating Parkinson's disease as people age, as the population ages. And so about 3% of everybody above age 65 has Parkinson's. Parkinson's is one of the neurodegenerative diseases. And what that means is there is a group of neurons, and I'm gonna go on the assumption here that there are probably some of you who have lots of experience with focused ultrasound and no experience with Parkinson's disease, others who may have a lot of experience with Parkinson's disease and no experience with focused ultrasound, and everybody in between. So please excuse some of the basic stuff uh, if it's uh, not new to you. But the inherent quality of these diseases is that a fixed group of nerve cells prematurely degenerates and dies. And one of the things that probably all of us were told in high school biology is still remains true, which is we are born with all of the brain cells that we ever have. There is some degree of neurogenesis, but it's never been shown to be clinically significant. And so for certain populations of neurons, that are there in fixed numbers, when you lose them, you have neurological symptoms. Uh, and in Parkinson's disease, one group of neurons that are lost is in an area called the substantia nigra. They uh, contain the neurotransmitter dopamine, and that loss of dopamine is the basis of many of the movement-related uh, symptoms of Parkinson's disease and the basis for much of the drug therapy for Parkinson's disease. And what I'll talk about, uh, uh, particularly during the end of this talk, is that there is no treatment uh, to slow or stop these diseases from progressing at this time. Many things have been tried. They have virtually all failed. And remember, all these diseases, whether they're Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease or even ALS, uh, when they're first diagnosed, patients are very mildly symptomatic. A Parkinson's patient might only have a little bit of tremor. Uh, it is the fact that this disease over years and decades is going to continue to worsen is what makes these the disabling conditions that they are. So particularly for the early aspect of Parkinson's disease, it primarily is classified as what's called a movement disorder because it affects movement. Involuntary movements, tremor, which is shaking, a regular uh, rhythmic involuntary movement, 
usually starts, and that's the commonest single symptom of Parkinson's disease, and then what's referred to as bradykinesia, slowness of movement, and again, it's an awkwardness of movement. People lose dexterity, buttoning your clothes, getting your keys out of your pocket, handling change, a slow awkwardness of movement that you see. Rigidity, and sometimes patients don't even sense this. This is something an examiner might sense, but it's a stiffness that goes with that slow, awkward movement. And the most disabling aspect, and probably the one that at least responds to the therapy, usually occurring years after diagnosis, is the loss of balance, frequent falling, freezing of gait, where patients kind of just get stuck, and then their body goes forward, and their feet stay on the floor, resulting in a serious fall. As I mentioned, it's diagnosed at a relatively early stage, and sometimes some neurologists talk about a honeymoon period. A honeymoon period in Parkinson's disease is when uh, they say, what's a good treatment for early Parkinson's disease? And the answer is anything. All of the drugs work. Exercise-based therapy works. So in the first few years of the disease, with relatively small amounts of medication, with few side effects, patients get good symptomatic relief. In that moderate stage, there's now accumulating disability, uh, more medications are used, higher doses of medications lead to more medication uh, side effects, and then in that moderate to advanced stage, the medications start to work erratically. In spite of large doses of medications, symptoms worsen to uh, the advanced stage where uh, there's, in spite of anything you do, there's increasing disability. And in that stage, again, besides falls, the other thing that's very poorly treatable is a Alzheimer-like dementia, a progressive loss of intellectual function. Uh, and again, so that is what advanced Parkinson's. So that's why there's a great deal of interest in what's called for all these diseases, disease-modifying therapy, sometimes even goes by the initials, DMT. And the answer is all of these diseases are looking for DMTs. All of these diseases carry not only a loss of cells, but characteristic changes within the cells. Uh, all the neurodegenerative diseases sometimes are called by neurochemists and molecular biologists proteinopathies because what's been identified is that there are certain proteins that become abnormal, uh, aggregate, accumulate into visible deposits within cells. And in Parkinson's disease, what was known in the 1930s, named for Otto Louis, uh, that insp inside the cells and uh, in the upper right is a slice through the substantia nigra, uh, the part of the brain uh, that uh, is affecting Parkinson's. Uh, that area that the white line, that is normally black, filled with dark pigmented cells. These cells will die off during the course of Parkinson's disease to the point that in advanced Parkinson's, 90% or greater of the cells are gone. And uh, what you find is in those remaining cells are these round intercellular intracytoplasmic accumulations uh, called Lewy bodies. And what was, and a lot of times genetics informs pathology. So these were known for, since the 1930s. Uh, but uh, we didn't know what their composition was. Uh, it's kind of a paradox in protein chemistry is that the first thing you want to do with a protein to analyze it is solubilize it. And all these things are insoluble, so it was always difficult doing the biochemistry on them. But when the first genetic forms of Parkinson's disease were discovered, they were discovered uh, to be in the gene that codes for a protein called alpha-synuclein. From genetic uh, recombinant work, then antibodies were made to alpha-synuclein and lo and behold, the major component of Lewy bodies known for the 60 years before that was in fact alpha-synuclein. And alpha-synuclein has become uh, the amyloid of Parkinson's disease. So amyloid is the, uh, the name of the protein that's deposited in Alzheimer's disease and is a major target for disease-modifying therapy uh, for Parkinson's disease. And now, 15, 20 years later, here comes the discovery of alpha-synuclein, and it is 
the major target for disease-modifying therapy for Parkinson's disease. Uh, so again, all of the neurodegenerative diseases, ALS, Huntington's disease, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and all the rare conditions in between, they all have deposits of abnormal protein. I would say it is a normal protein that becomes abnormal. It can become abnormal through a genetic mutation, or it can become abnormal because of some cellular modification. So the well known, most well-known is amyloid beta. And again, uh, I would say that 90% of the disease-modifying therapy uh, for Alzheimer's disease is really focused on some aspect of amyloid. And again, we're looking at that same strategy in Parkinson's. Like many of these things, these abnormal proteins are neurotoxic. You put them in culture or you inject them into animals and they kill cells. Uh, so the question is, how do they become neurotoxic? They misfold. These are complex proteins with hydrophobic and hydrophilic uh, components with it. And frankly, protein misfolding goes on all the time. But if there's enough of these proteins, they not only, they self-aggregate. And many of these proteins are close to having prion-like properties. So prions actually form, and these are the things that cause mad cow disease, uh, they are proteins that can enforce a abnormal con uh, conformation on a normal protein. So they're self-propagating. And some of these proteins, to some extent, even have some self-propagating properties. But they go from misfolded to oligomers to fibrils. And those intermediate forms appear to be the most neurotoxic. Uh, they do a lot of damage to cells in many pathways. Uh, they damage mitochondria, the energy production factories of cells. Uh, they really screw up the normal protein degradation system of a cell. They block proteasomes. They interfere with lysosomal functions. Remember, uh, uh, I describe cells a lot of times as a really bad pottery class. Uh, they're making jars, ceramic jars, all the time. And frankly, most of them are defective. Uh, so what do you do with defective pottery? You throw it in the trash. Uh, and so the cells have a very, very complex, powerful system for getting rid of all of these defective proteins that they're making constantly. If, on the other hand, you get a piece of pottery that is not only defective, but also will screw up the trash apparatus, now the whole cell becomes overwhelmed. And what's disturbing, but also been a key to new therapies, is that cell, this protein, when it's produced in one cell, can actually be passed to another cell. So one toxic protein can be passed from another. Uh, actually, I think I, yep. And again, some of the, the uh, drugs in clinical trial right now uh, are designed to interrupt some part of this cascade of going from abnormal protein to aggregated abnormal protein to toxic protein or blocking its toxicity. Uh, uh, our neighbors at Georgetown uh, published a very small but exciting study on an anti-cancer drug already FDA approved for cancer uh, called nilotinib, uh, which is a tyrosine con kinase inhibitor, uh, and uh, it blocks the abnormal phosphorylation of these proteins. I should note that many times in the abnormal uh, folding process, phosphorylation is a very common event, uh, usually at specific sites at the protein. Uh, inosine uh, is also in a small clinical trial already. Uh, there's an association between high uric acid and high urate levels and a lower incidence of Parkinson's disease. You know, people who have gout don't tend to get Parkinson's, and urate raises uh, inosine levels. Uh, there's a, a molecular chaperone called ambroxol, and uh, it's involved in preserving the enzyme activity of a lysosomal enzyme uh, called uh, glucose ribosidase, or just GCAs, and it enhances synuclein. And this takes advantage, again, of genetic discoveries. Uh, one of the most common genetic risk factors of Parkinson's disease is the same gene that causes 
the lysosomal disease, Gaucher's disease. So Gaucher's disease is the commonest lysosomal storage disease, and it's one of those situations where you need a homozygous defect, uh, mutations in both genes to get the disease. But if you have a single uh, gene defect, you are at six-fold increased risk of Parkinson's disease, the basis for these strategies. And as I mentioned, uh, there is evidence that alpha-synuclein, abnormal alpha-synuclein, can move through the brain. And this may relate to the fact that there is a well-known sequence of neurons that are affected in Parkinson's disease. And this is the work that's been widely published and publicized by the neuropathologist, the Brock husband and wife team. And what they found is that when Parkinson's disease is diagnosed, there are other centers that are already well affected, that we normally see changes in olfaction and pathology in the olfactory bulb. It's very common, but unfortunately nonspecific in early Parkinson's. We also see uh, constipation, and we see deposits of alpha-synuclein in the autonomic nervous system that connect the gut. And so there is a theory, reasonable theory right now, is that the pathological spread uh, changes in pathology in, in Parkinson's disease is due to cell-to-cell -cell spread of alpha-synuclein, making it an opportunity for therapy. So what about current therapy? Current therapy is all about relieving symptoms, and minimizing side effects. And after 50 years, the most widely used medication for Parkinson's disease, the most effective medication for Parkinson's disease remains carbidopa levodopa. It is a building block of dopamine, uh, and it has relatively few side effects, commonly just nausea and dizziness. Why are now there are 10 FDA-approved medications of Parkinson's? Why do we need them? And the answer is because of dose fluctuations that occur with carbidopa levodopa. They come in two forms. The first is the fact is that this is a short half-life medication. And in mild early Parkinson's, it seems to have a long duration of action, unclear, the brain somehow is able to store it, uh, but you, even though it lasts in the blood only about 60 to 90 minutes, patients take it twice a day or three times a day and it seems to last all day. But in advanced Parkinson's, then it starts to act like what it is, a short-acting medication. So now patients are taking it four, five, six, seven times a day, and it's still acting erratically and inconsistently. So that's wearing off. That's the off part of those fluctuations. The other is that as Parkinson's advances and with years of use of this medication, it can now induce involuntary movements called dyskinesias, a type of a hypersensitivity syndrome. Uh, again, in, in a lot of patients, they're even called sometimes LIDS, levodopa-induced dyskinesias. Uh, they're associated with the highest dose. When you start to see, and this is what you'll see uh, when Michael J. Fox is on TV, that moving around, wiggly, fidgety movements, those are drug-induced dyskinesias. And frankly, for many patients, uh, they are much more tolerable than the disease itself. So they're perfectly, they would rather have these abnormal movements uh, than be so stiff and immobile that they can't get around. But as they go on, they can actually intrude into normal movements and increase uh, the disability of the disease. So what we have for all drugs and for all forms of treatment, including ultrasound, we talk about a therapeutic window. A therapeutic window is how much you can give to get an effect compared to how much you can give for a side effect. A really good drug, at a low dose, you get benefit, and you have to go to an astronomical drug, dose before you have side effects. This is not the case with levodopa as the years go on. The therapeutic window narrows so that the patient bounces from being on, off, or on with dyskinesias. And again, the goal is to keep people in that purple zone being on, but with advanced Parkinson's, it's not easily done. Somebody's off, you give them more medication, 
they now have wild dyskinesias. So what do we have that's available? So the obvious part is if this is a short-acting drug, make it a long-acting drug. And it only took about 30 years uh, to come out with a really good long-acting form of it, which came out about two years ago, uh, called Ritari. It's a very long form of it. There are other medications uh, that increase its duration of action. These are the dopamine agonists. They're kind of normal drugs. They have half-lives of six to eight hours, but they have other side effects. Uh, they're FDA-approved medications that extend the duration of action of levodopa by blocking its degradation. Uh, but uh, their effects are more in the uh, 10 or 20 percent. Uh, Ritari lasts a long time. Ritari has a duration of action of about six hours. For some patients, they even opt for a surgical procedure where a intestinal gel of levodopa is infused. And there's a programmable pump at the end of that tube coming out of that patient's gut, uh, which is adjustable so the patient can get relief of their Parkinson's without dyskinesias. Uh, the major role that people go for surgery, the commonest reason that a Parkinson's patient goes for surgery is when these dose fluctuations cannot be controlled adequately. And that is the commonest reason they go for DBS and uh, is one of the uh, reasons we're exploring focused ultrasound for these patients. So DBS is the gold standard of surgical therapy. Uh, it's an implantable pacemaker-like device. Uh, and again, it's designed to give patients consistent result improvement of their symptoms. Uh, it usually doesn't improve patients better than their best drug therapy, except in the situation of tremor. Surgical therapy in general can be substantially more effective than any form of drug therapy. So even if patients have a tremor that doesn't go away with levodopa, surgical therapy can eliminate it. But for most of the patients, they're going to have improvement in their on time and reduction in their off time without dyskinesias. So uh, there are about 170,000 of these have been implanted. Uh, uh, it is, in fact, uh, some places describe this as minimally invasive neurosurgery. Uh, the only people I've said describe this are actually neurosurgeons. Uh, patients don't consider it minimally invasive. Uh, it actually is two surgical procedures because the pacemaker device in the chest is implanted as a separate procedure. But it works. You know, it, and we're talking about on-time changes of several hours. There are certain aspects that no form of surgery will improve. So uh, you don't improve uh, if patients have dementia. Uh, surgery for Parkinson's does not improve it. Uh, and, you know, it is the classic risk of surgery. All surgery carries with it the risk of bleeding and infection. Uh, and any neurosurgeon or neurologist will tell you that the most dangerous place to have bleeding or infection is within the brain. Uh, and it is hardware, so hardware can fail, and it fails at a sizable percentage of the time. You know, not a lot, one in a hundred, a couple in a hundred, and as I talk to these patients about, it's one in a hundred, two in a hundred, uh, that not only will have bleeding, but will have bleeding that is clinically significant. You can have a stroke-like effect if you have bleeding into the brain with real impairment of function. When infection occurs in these settings, the common strategy, sadly, is the entire system has to be pulled out. So bleeding and infection are real risks of DBS. Uh, and now we have non-invasive but non-incisional brain surgery, uh, which, you know, I always worry about, you know, how do you describe FUS? And I think that's the term that I, that it is, in fact, surgery. There is, in fact, tissue destruction going on in, in focused ultrasound. But there is no uh, opening of the skull. Uh, and so in terms of infection or bleeding, the theoretical risk is much less. And it is capitalizing on the fact that prior to DBS, there were decades of experience of plain old lesional surgery going into brain. So in a lot of ways, what we are currently doing with focused ultrasound is old-fashioned surgery with a new, more controllable modality. 
And so here's, again, uh, a typical uh, patient in the device. Uh, most of what's concealing the patients is, of course, the uh, chilling bag uh, that is uh, eliminating the heat that's building up in the skull. And uh, I've been impressed by the accuracy that went of the predicted lesion. So that white spot in the lower in the thalamus, that is a, uh, a T2 MRI lesion. And it's really pretty much usually within a millimeter of where we predict it. And sometimes that's not the case for DBS. Most DBS is done with an MRI beforehand, and sadly, sometimes we have a real unpleasant surprise of where that electrode is when the patient has their post-operative films. So what gives it control? What gives it control is MR thermography online. Uh, that as we apply sonic energy, we apply it in a dose titration fashion, just like giving a drug. If you were working with uh, an anti-cancer drug, a common way of, of giving people an anti-cancer drug is to give them a low dose, observe them, see everything is good, if things are moving in the right direction, do a dose escalation. And that's what we do with sonic energy. And we have real-time feedback about how much brain temperature is elevated uh, with the amount of sonic energy. Uh, because here, uh, what you're seeing is amounts that are lytic. But remember, 37 is where you're starting out. That's normal temperature. Uh, you probably get to about 55 is enough of the heat to coagulate or destroy brain. But that gives you a wide window in the 40s of raising brain temperature that will give you relief of clinical symptoms, or maybe symptoms will appear, but they're reversible. So you can confirm the target the physiologically appropriate target with sub-lethal amounts of, of energy. And then uh, once uh, everybody in the team is in agreement about the appropriateness of the target, then the next step is to raise the sonic energy until it's permanent. And again, you have a patient who's awake, you can talk to, you have both temperature and the MRI to confirm location, and you have a patient to confirm optimal uh, clinical results. And here is uh, one of the, up until recently, the largest study of essential tremor uh, from Jeff Elias in the New England Journal. And what generated so much excitement about this study is the magnitude of that effect is comparable to DBS. You know, the magnitude of that effect, you know, 80% tremor reduction. And patients, most of those patients, and I really like the honesty of the way this work is where you have each patient as a line and so you can tell that the overwhelming majority of patients maintain their benefit for a year. Because we'll talk about pros and cons of DBS shortly. Here's part of a major study which is currently embargoed but will be appearing soon. Uh, we're 76 patients. Here's our group. And again, close to DBS types of results with total tremor scores uh, that are improved in about the 50, 60 percent, not just tremor amplitude, but overall disability of tremor. Uh, and again, in general, maintaining that effect for at least a year. Uh, one of the more dramatic results is on the right, uh, where in the upper part is a patient with a particularly severe tremor. Some of these patients are off the scale. If a uh, top rated tremor is an inch of peak to peak amplitude, these are people up two or three inches of what they, when they attempt to do something. This gentleman could barely put the pen on the paper, and I hope most of your drawings here in this room are better than the one below it, but that is a greater than 90% uh, amplitude. So again, for a first experience in a placebo-controlled multi-center study, uh, this is comparable to the early work that was seen in DBS. And the message is this is an evolving technology, an evolving technique. And every person who does a procedure will tell you, you get better as you do more patients. And here's a great example from the Swiss group where they had trouble getting the temperature up uh, in those first few patients, and they didn't get much benefit. And so these are actually consecutive patients going from left to right, and the lower part of it 
is the amount of improvement in their overall Parkinson's scores. And here you can see that as they did more patients, they got better uh, at doing this uh, with better clinical results. And again, to a level that is really in the same ballpark as DBS. And we're involved right now uh, as the first trial of pallidotomy for Parkinson's disease. And pallidotomy for Parkinson's disease is not new. Uh, again, there are probably a couple thousand patients who have undergone pallidotomy prior to DBS. It is the appropriate target, not only for dose fluctuations, but for patients who have lots of these dyskinesias and abnormal movements. And, uh, and so for the first time, it's being targeted in DBS. And this is actually from our first patients. Uh, again, the, the MR thermography predicted the site of the lesion, which pretty much occupies the entire globus pallidus interna, uh, which accounts for the, the patient's improvement. And so what we're going to see right now is whether or not this is comparable to unilateral uh, uh, DBS. One of the interesting things about pallidotomy is that frequently it's an exception to the rule that when you work on one brain side, you only get benefit on one brain side. This kinesia seemed to be improved also on the opposite side as well. And we'll see as time goes on if that's consistent with an FUS pallidotomy. Uh, this usually uh, puts all medical students and residents to sleep. Uh, but this is the internal circuitry of the basal ganglia. And I just want to start with the fact that when you talk to patients, it is totally counterintuitive that you can improve their neurological disease by killing part of their brain. You know, uh, their problem with their brain is that they're losing cells. Uh, why on earth would they get better if you killed some more of them? Uh, but the answer is what this, the m message of this is this particular region of brain is a cascade of cells that excite and inhibit. And so for any time you lose cells, one group of cells, there's another group of cells that become overactive. And the groups of cells that become overactive are in the two targets of surgery uh, for Parkinson's disease. The subthalamic nucleus, the commonest site of the DBS, and the globus pallidus interna. So when uh, Malin DeLong and company uh, did this work years ago, for which he won the Lasker Award, these are sites that in Parkinson's disease, when you lose the cells in the substantia nigra, these other downstream neurons become overactive. I know, it, it come, I'm surprised it doesn't come up more often. It's like, how are you going to fix me by killing more of my brain? Uh, the big difference, remember I said, this is, this is just a new way of doing old-fashioned surgery. Thousands of pallidotomies have been done before. Uh, and they've been done under, uh, with a thermal probe, and that's on the right. And one of these holes, uh, it's surprising that it's reasonably well controlled. So this is a thermal probe. You heat it up, but there was no MR thermography. You heat it up, and you hoped that your lesion uh, would be within the bounds. Uh, there's also been uh, gamma knife surgery for movement disorders, uh, radio surgery which is quite accurate, it's MRI guided, but the major difference between gamma irradiation and focused ultrasound is that X-rays don't affect things in real time, which is why there's an entire field of radiation dosimetry. If you have colleagues who are radiation oncologists, you know, all of their, uh, you know, they spend uh, many hours of coursework trying to calculate how much X-rays they need for how much killing. Because it doesn't occur in real time. It's a calculation. On the other hand, thermal lesions from focused ultrasound, and again, under the parameters that we do it, we're making a thermal lesion. Uh, there's a reasonable correlation between how hot you heat brain, not how hot you heat a probe, and the size of the lesion. Again, we're still mastering that, but we have a greater degree of real-time control than any of these older techniques. Because uh, the rule of thumb in all neurosurgery, well, remember, the standard joke, what are the three most important things in neurology or the three most important things in real estate? Location, location, location. And in this type of lesional work, the biggest rule is don't miss your target. 
Uh, and here's a superimposed radio frequency probe because it gives you an idea of what happens if you miss the target. So the target is that the globus pallidus interna. And uh, if you look on the bottom parts of it, you might find a dark area. It says TO. TO stands for tractus opticus or optic tract. And if, you, if the lesion extends into that, you will give people a field cut. They won't be able to see on part of, uh, you know, part of their visual field. On the other hand, you'll see IC on the left or above. IC stands for internal capsule. Within the internal capsule is the corticospinal fa factors, the things that connect your brain to your spinal cord and to motor function, and you have a lesion that extends into that, you will cause weakness on one body side. So what's going on is refining our technique so that we get the best possible clinical result without having the lesion extend into brain-sensitive areas that will give us real symptoms. So again, uh, that's why, like I said, it's, it's, uh, my hope is that we will learn and improve our technique with every one of these patient volunteers. Uh, it's funny. We're doing the GPI. Why not do the most common target for deep brain stimulation the subthalamic nucleus. And the reason for that is that uh, when you destroy that area, uh, sometimes you unleash uh, abnormal movements. And I know that Jeff Elias uh, here at UVA is very interested in approaching that target, but because of the fact that there's really not much of a history in the pre-DBS world of attacking that target, we've chosen, uh, both UVA and us have chosen to go to the commoner target, the GPI. But in a lot of ways, you get similar results. There have been comparison studies, and they're really not all that different. STN and GPI both give similar clinical results. The one part of DBS surgery that isn't part of FUS is microelectric recording. Remember I mentioned that the MRI for DBS is done beforehand, and when we open up the skull, the brain might shift around a little. And for that reason, before we implant the DBS, we explore that area by microelectric recording. Uh, and that's what confirms our target. We might change the target, move it a couple millimeters back or forward uh, before that. Remember, but that's an open surgical procedure. So that uh, isn't, isn't available with current technology for FUS. And that's one of the reasons that uh, we've chosen the GPI. Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, a GPI is a longer surgical procedure. It's a bigger piece of brain, and the recording is very time-consuming, which is why, even though they're comparable, most centers prefer doing STN. And, and this slide will show you. You get a similar result. Good is great. And again, going from baseline to six months, uh, STN on the top, and GPI on the bottom, the improvement in the amount of gray is comparable. Now, in this study, patients with dyskinesia were directed to GPI. So again, because of the well-established anti-dyskinesia effect of GPI surgery. And this is GPI DBS. So this is actually the slide that my patients are most interested in. How is this similar, and how is it different? From, uh, from DBS? Well, again, numbers. <laughs> there have been, the last time I talked to the Medtronics people, there have been 170,000 patients implanted with DBS. The last time I talked with the Insight Tech people, I think we're up to 700 patients worldwide. 700 is a pretty good number, but it's not 170,000. Uh, they both require a head frame. Uh, they both require uh, patient cooperation. Clearly, uh, one is surgery. Uh, analgesia and sometimes anesthesia is needed. Uh, there is some pain in FUS, and, and especially for patients who have a uh, very low skull density index where we have to use a lot of sonication, but it's not comparable to the pain of having uh, your skin in size tunneled uh, and your skull drilled into. Uh, again, non-incisional. There's a lot of surgery. There's actually two surgeries. Sometimes patients forget that. 
uh, one to implant uh, the brain electrodes and a second surgery that's basically pacemaker surgery with known risks of bleeding and infection. Right now, let's say the, the risk of uh, some neurological defect uh, is small in around the 1%, but clearly there are going to be unknown risks. One is adjustable. The other is a one right now, a one-time deal. You go in, you got to get it right the first time. I say right now because certainly in the old days, people had second surgery if their symptoms came back or if they got worse. Uh, so uh, in the future, I'm sure we will be exploring, retreating patients who might have recurrent symptoms. But right now, I don't think uh, anybody's been retreated. Uh, and again, the other part is this adjustability, but the adjustability requires the technology, which of course can fail, and there are many office visits afterwards adjusting these. You know, patients spend on the order of two or three visits to the programmer of a half an hour to an hour visit adjusting them. And because of fears of unexpected uh, side effects from treating both sides with a surgical lesion, currently we're only treating, for most of the patients, we're only treating one side. Uh, this comes from very old surgical lesion, uh, literature, like the kind of lesions I showed before, and I, I personally think that uh, it definitely should be explored to treat the second side. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, DBS doesn't cause a lesion. FUS causes a lesion. Uh, inherently, DBS is safer. And uh, I always correct them and say, DBS doesn't cause an intentional lesion. Uh, but DBS passes a two millimeter probe inches within the brain. And again, for the brain mapping, it's common to do two or three passes. Uh, I personally don't think that's really good for the brain. Uh, FUS causes a lesion at the target. The principle of FUS in the brain is the same as the principle of gamma knife. There is an array. That helmet has an array of over a thousand separate emitters. And at the target, all thousand of those beams converge. So the rest of the brain only sees one one thousandth of that energy. There is no so-called path effect. And frankly, there are not a small number of neurologists in neurosurgery surgeons who think that passing that probe through your frontal lobe fibers to do DBS surgery is really not good for the brain. And maybe some of the late problems we see in DBS, problems with walking, problems with dementia, maybe that's not all Parkinson's disease. Maybe some of that has been worsened by DBS. And one of the good things about our current study is we do detailed cognitive measures on all these folks. And as the years go on, will be able to know, is there less cognitive decline with this technique than with DBS? Uh, the future. As I mentioned, there is no disease-modifying therapy for any neurological disease. And sadly, there have been a number of trials that have failed, and we live in the molecular age. We live in an age of gene therapy. We live in an age of recombinant proteins. There have been clinical trials of gene therapy. There are many recombinant proteins that have been FDA approved. We live in an age where we can make stem cells out of pretty much anything. There are Nobel Prize winning work for making stem cells out of skin cells. Uh, so we've got all of these high tech therapies, none of them pass the blood brain barrier. Uh, great gene therapy. And this is from the work of Michael Caplet and, and, and injecting a gene that makes a enzyme that makes an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and it is basically genetic DBS. He puts it in the exact same place with a surgical technique. He puts it in the SDN, and he suppresses activity. And uh, these are in practice, but again, the way he does it is he injects directly into brain. Uh, similar things have been done with enzymes that uh, make dopamine, and this is uh, one that's been in trial called ProSavin, it's a cocktail of three genes that make three important enzymes. And you can see in small numbers of cases, uh, you do have improvement going down. It's like golf. Movement disorder scores are like golf. Well, lower is better. 
So the patient numbers go down, and that's a sign of improvement. And on PET scan, you do see some evidence that they're making more dopamine. And again, these are current clinical trials. Uh, then the most famous of all of the neuroprotective therapies, the one that's had the most work, is a growth factor called glial-derived neurotrophic factor, or GDNF. And back in 2003, there was a really exciting trial that if you infuse this into brain, advanced Parkinson's patients would get better. And they got better over months, and that's the lower left, that's their, their off scores, uh, like things were growing. Remember, in animal models, neurons sprout. They improve. Uh, they don't die in the presence of GDNF. But later trials failed. There was a larger trial of this with a pump, and the question is, did it fail because there really wasn't good enough penetration of this large molecule into brain? Again, same strategy, a related trial. So nurturin uh, is a GDNF relative, and in animal models, uh, and again, the animal model is you take a toxin, usually in this case MPTP, and on the right side upper, you inject it into a monkey brain, and that's why uh, there's not that much brown on that side. You get rid of the dopaminergic terminals. In the presence of GDNF, the B, now the thing looks closer to normal, that there's brown on both sides. And this is the work, again, 10 years ago of Jeff Cordover, where these animals improved. Great. Let's see what the human work looks like. And the human work is mediocre. I should say the result is mediocre. The execution of the trial is great, uh, but in general, for this entire field, it has been very, very difficult to take promising animal results and reproduce them in humans. And again, even on autopsy, there was just very, very little evidence that the stuff was really getting in, that the gene was being made. And so the issue for me, that whole question of scaling up, the majority of work in this field is done in rodents, mice or rats. Now we're talking about a brain that is one one hundredth to one one thousandth the, the volume of a human brain. And even when you scale up to monkeys, it's still small. So again, I always worry about tissue penetration. Uh, this work is going forward. There's a current trial with GDNF as gene therapy, but we'll see how they do. But I, I worry they use what's called, uh, here there's a mini pump made by Mentronic who makes the, the leading thing. Is that going to be adequate? And again, this still requires an implantable system pumping into brain. Well, you know, people don't even talk about stem cells very more, much in the way, because there was so much hype 15 years ago, and we're still waiting for the first uh, stem cell research in humans uh, in Parkinson's disease. Remember, this was uh, an argument 10 or 15 years ago, and we're still waiting for the first clinical trial. Uh, now, there are two types of approaches to stem cells. One you could use with any cell. One is that you put, you have them make good things, and mesenchymal stem cells make a lot of good things. They make things that are anti-inflammatory. They make growth factors. And, and, of course, you can genetically modify them and have them make anything you want. But the holy grail has always been to use these as replacement neurons, to actually have them go into the brain and replace and reintegrate inside the brain. And these have not been achieved. Uh, as I mentioned, this field uh, is on the verge of losing credibility because there have been so many promising animal experiments, but uh, the results in humans have either been negative or much more modest than it. And in part, again, uh, it may be the scaling up problem. It also may be part is that we have animal models of Parkinson's disease. We have animal models of Alzheimer's disease, but it's not really the disease. Uh, nobody wants to wait around, uh, remember, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease of uh, years and decades. So if you didn't have something that had an accelerated course, uh, you would spend your entire career doing an experiment. So again, the fact that these are more, more accelerated diseases is the only way to practically do research. But frankly, in animals, what we look 
if you t- knock out the substantia nigra in an animal, in a rodent, they don't get Parkinson's. They circle. And so you look at circling behavior. So these are not truly the disease. They are models of the disease. And the dirty little secret about stem cell therapy. So not only does it have low tech, uh, so that's a hypodermic needle uh, invented in 1835. And that's what we use in, in a modern variation to put cells uh, into the brain. Not only is it invasive, but it's actually fairly ineffective. Remember, we have diffusion problems from proteins and genes. Cells are a 1,000 times their size, and they sit as a blob, and this is a monkey experiment from years ago, uh, along the needle track. So uh, unless you're willing, which some centers do, to do multiple needle tracks into the brain, uh, how do you distribute these cells? Uh, and this has been a problem. The blood-brain barrier has been an obstacle for therapy forever, uh, for all, and particularly the larger the type of therapy you use. There's conventional drugs. You must change their solubility properties so you can get them at the brain. But then you have proteins, genes, cells, and current methods don't get them into the brain. So uh, what we have now is still invasive. The gold standard is still to inject it into the brain and use a controlled low pressure system called convection based delivery, which was actually pioneered by one of the neurosurgeons here at Oldfield uh, years ago. And that's still the gold standard. So again, it's basically a very sophisticated pump. Uh, It's interesting that there were comments by Ed Newelt who developed this technique that if you put a hyperosmolar solution of mannitol into the carotid artery, uh, water uh, comes out of the endothelial cells into the hyperosmolar uh, solution. They shrink, and as they shrink, they open the blood-brain barrier, and that still remains a, uh, one of the more effective therapies. Uh, Ed was kind enough to say he's still waiting to have this technique become obsolete, uh, and hopefully we will make it obsolete in the future. Another thing that's been out there is using what's called the Trojan horse approach which is to couple your gene or protein of choice to a molecule that binds brain endothelia and is transported across brain endothelia, which is the base of the blood-brain barrier. Uh, And uh, usually it's for things that are important to brain that can't normally get in, so the brain has an active transport system. This includes transferrin, the major iron-binding protein, and insulin. So again, antibodies against insulin, antibodies against transferrin, when coupled to a gene or protein of choice, can bring it into brain. And they're the best. They're almost close to FDA approval. And they, this is what the field is after 30 years. So the best case scenario from the blood to brain for proteins, you can get 2% in, which means 98% goes someplace else. Uh, And that's why, because of that, And the other aspect is, again, putting it through the nose, uh, intranasal delivery. But again, there's actually a nose-brain barrier along with the blood-brain barrier. So again, this process has it. And that's why there has been so much interest over the last 10 years in the use of focused ultrasound to open the blood-brain barrier. And again, much of it is the work of Clairvaux Heinonen, of Nathan McDonald, of Eliza Kongafu. Uh, These have been the pioneers who have spent a decade working out this technically. But it's a very simple principle that there are actually uh, micro bubbles, you know, gas-filled lipids that your cardiologist uses, uh, your radiologist uses every day. They are an FDA-approved ultrasound contrast agent. It turns out when you put these things in the circulation and you apply ultrasound, uh, that energy whether or not they explode or just vibrate a lot, but that energy is conveyed to the endothelia, and there's enough of that energy is that they separate the tight junctions between brain endothelia, and that is the basis of the blood-brain barrier. And again, 10 years, lots of experiments, you know, by very talented people to get those parameters just right that you can do that without causing brain injury. 
because what a lot of times people forget is that the blood-brain barrier is there for a reason. And so that if it's there too long or it's open too, uh, too widely, uh, blood products that are neurotoxic will get in and you'll get frank hemorrhages uh, in it. So again, uh, this is a real technical challenge to do it just right. And after a decade, they've really got the parameters down. Uh, and this is the work uh, from Nate McDonald's lab and that that brown on the edge, so L is for lumen. And uh, for blood-brain barrier people, L is for lumen, the inside of a blood vessel, and A is commonly for abluminal surface. So an endothelial cell has one side that faces the blood and the other side that faces the brain. And here we have that B, and after things have been sonicated, that's brown, because the commonest marker we use is horseradish peroxidase. It has, or, these are, uh, these are electron micrographs, it turns brown, and you can see that after sonication, we are getting this large protein, it's about 32 kilodaltons into it. And the other part is in this experiment, they treated them, they sonicated them, they sonicated them again, and there's no brain pathology. So this is, again, one of these uh, great papers that show that you can do this, you can open up a blood-brain barrier without brain pathology. And now we're starting to see it being approached. And I think this is from uh, uh, the, the Columbia group where now you're seeing gene therapy, which used to be given by injecting into brain. Now you see the gene, in this case, the viral vector is being placed in the circulation. And now you're seeing the virus expressing GDNF to some degree. Remember in, the, in E, that blank one, that's been treated with a toxin. So lots of green is normal, black is abnormal, and you're seeing partial restoration of GDNF by that viral vector that was not placed in brain. It was placed in the circulation, and then there was focused ultrasound. Uh, again, the world of nanoparticles is exploding. Uh, the technology of the different types of nanoparticles that bind to different things. The number of people trained in this technology is exploding. So it's not surprising that nanoparticle delivery is used. And in this situation, uh, nanoparticles uh, that are placed in blood, not in brain, they're getting into brain and they're staying there. And this is from uh, uh, the Price Group. Uh, even after 28 days, it's still there. And it's only the rest of that blank that brain is gray because it's targeted. You can open up the blood-brain barrier, unlike mannitol, where you sonicate. So the sonication is what targets your gene. Uh, and as I mentioned, the gold standard is convection-based delivery. You know, you pump it in. But it turns out that focused ultrasound can even enhance uh, convection-based delivery because here the gene product is put on the left uh, is put in without it, but in the presence of you sonicate that area, you find that the energy is being transmitted to the particles and it's enhancing their diffusion. Uh, there's a common misconception that the brain is really tightly packed. The brain is not that tightly packed. About 20, 30 percent of it is extracellular space. So if you enhance diffusion, you will enhance movement through the, through the brain. And actually, similar experiments have been done by the Columbia group where the gene is not placed in the blood. It's actually placed in the nose. And by targeting and exciting it, you see better diffusion within brain from intranasal delivery. So getting back to Parkinson's disease. One of the anti-synuclein uh, strategies is an antibody strategy. And remember I mentioned that part of the pathology we think of Parkinson's is that synuclein spreads from cell to cell. If it spreads from cell to cell, it's going to be in the extracellular space. If it's in the extracellular space, it is amenable to clearance or binding by antibody. So that's really enhanced this idea. Remember, anti-amyloid vaccines have been in clinical trial for the last 10 years. So, but it, uh, now we're waiting for the first anti-synuclein vaccine trials. And this is animal model studies that show 
that anti that you can really, in an animal model that makes too much synuclein, you can clear synuclein with an anti-synuclein antibody. Uh, there as animal work. Uh, as I mentioned, anti-amyloid vaccines for Alzheimer's disease have been around for about a decade. Uh, gee, why aren't they FDA approved yet? The answer is they work inconsistently. Because remember, antibody is placed, the vaccine is in the blood. The pathology is in the brain. We know very well know from animals that it's much more effective if you put the antibody directly into brain. So here is the compromise. Taking, in this case, these animals have endogenous antibodies against amyloid, and if this is this thing they call scanning ultrasound. So basically, what they mean by that is they take that spot of focused ultrasound and they gradually move it, step it, so they treat a very, very large area of brain. And when they do that, and this is from the New Zealand group that's appeared in science, they have a significant reduction in amyloid burden, and the animals, again, uh, had behavioral improvement without pathology. And this, is, this work has been reproduced in two other labs uh, and is the basis for hopefully soon Hopefully, I'm not saying anything underturned, but uh, soon to begin uh, pilot trials in Alzheimer's disease using focused ultrasound to try to improve uh, clearance of amyloid. And again, that same approach, if successful in Alzheimer's, will clearly be applied to Parkinson's. Well, what about cells? And this is the work of uh, Clairvaux Heinen's group, who were the first to show that you can actually put stem cells, in this case, they had to put them in the carotid, and you got a few of them in that with focused ultrasound, in spite of the fact that these are neuroprogenitor cells, they're 10 microns across. Uh, a gap in the blood-brain barrier is probably less than a micron. There's still a couple of them are getting in. So there are very few, uh, and it took an intracarotid injection. So we, at the time, were working with another technique to try to enhance this. So in general, pros and cons. It's certainly far less invasive than an intracerebral and, frankly, multiple intracerebral injections. It has the potential for better distribution. The natural way all forms of nutrition are distributed to brain is through the circulation. So if you're going to deliver something to the brain, it makes perfect sense to use the blood vessels, not the CSF, not directly into brain. But as I mentioned, and I'll reinforce, uh, Current injection techniques are not only uh, potentially dangerous, but they're ineffective for a large target area. So again, uh, the pros of FUS mediated and BBDD means blood brain barrier disruption, uh, which is the term for it, but it's inefficient. When um, we ran the numbers on some of the published work, sadly only 0.05% of the cells that were injected in the carotid ended up there. And again, there's been 10 years of work optimizing sonication, so I don't think we can expect a big jam, you know, uh, jump because if we push the sonication, we're probably going to cause brain barrier. So we've been working with another technique, which is known as magnetic attraction or magnetic targeting. And there's a whole literature on this, mostly with nanoparticles, and a lot of it with cancer chemotherapy. You take nanoparticles that are iron-based, you attach your chemotherapy to it, and you can attract it to the site of the tumor with an external magnet. Sometimes they even implant a magnet to gather up all the magnetic particles. And we had done some work with this in a model of head injury. So again, uh, and this is the, the brainchild of my colleague, Paul Yurowski, because when I first heard of this, I really thought, you know, I thought this was not going to work. Uh, and I first had to be convinced that this wasn't going to be toxic to the cell. And the cells engulf them. We did toxicity studies. They differentiate. They divide. Uh, they're perfectly happy engulfing every one of these nanoparticles that we give them. And when they are full, they are totally full. They have 30,000 particles per cell in them. Uh, on electron micrograph, you can't find uh, free cytoplasm, uh, which is actually good. Because my other misconception is that when we put these things in a magnetic field, I initially thought the particles were just going to fly out and the cell was going to explode. Uh, but when they're really tightly packed, 
they act like one big particle. And down there, it's, all you have to do is put a refrigerator magnet uh, on the bottom of the dish, and pretty much you gather up all the cells uh, there. So you can move them around very nicely, and they're happy with a magnetic field. And, when we, and we did this in vivo, and I did it and published it. Uh, and that is a rat with a schematic of a magnetic hat. A magnetic hat is basically a refrigerator magnet that has been uh, uh, screwed onto the uh, animal's head. Uh, we have to warn the animal handlers that they have to be in special non-ferrous cages because they're fairly powerful magnets. And occasionally you'll find when the animals, if they put the wrong thing on, stuck to the top of the cage. You know, uh, they're, they're very tolerant animals. And this is a model of head injury. And head injury does cause blood-brain barrier injury. And so without head injury and without this technique, none of the cells get into the brain. You know, that's the bottom line, red line. With head injury, some get in, but a lot more, several fold get in if after the head injury, we had them wear the magnetic hat for a couple of days. So if it worked for that model of blood-brain barrier, maybe we can combine this technique with uh, FUS-mediated blood-brain barrier. Uh, and we do have an animal device. This was my finest hour of political achievement of my career because the animal MRI is owned by the University of Maryland and the uh, sonication device is owned by the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs. So uh, I got two large agencies to agree to share, uh, which occasionally does work. And again, here's the animal device. It's, uh, it's nowhere near as sophisticated. It's got eight elements, but it's got pretty good accuracy with expert hands, that of Viktor Frankl, uh, where on the bottom ones, there are our targets all lined up. And here's the post-gadolinium one in the bottom. And we've got pretty good blood-brain barrier opening for every one of the targets that we hit. Uh, general rule of thumb in all presentations, if someone says, this is a representative picture, translate best you know, uh, for that. Because a lot of times it doesn't work that way. So here in this situation, we got not a spot, but a whole column. And that blue on A is Evans blue. And that is a marker for albumin, a marker for blood-brain barrier opening. And so we got it not just in where the target was, the striatum, but we got it up and down. And I actually had to, uh, so again, this is very multidisciplinary. It works very nicely because uh, our areas of expertise and ignorance do not overlap at all, so there's rarely an argument. So Dr. Frankel, our expert in ultrasound, was very worried about this animal because he saw all of these holes. Uh, I had to reassure him those are not holes. Those are the fiber tracts of the striatum, and that's normal anatomy. So we didn't have any pathology, and we got a few cells in. So in the bottom, oops, sorry. In the bottom uh, ones, blue are iron staining. And what we did to confirm that this were, in fact, the cells we put in, because one of the problems in this field is that they're nanoparticles. They're not degradable. The same cannot be said for cells. So when the cells die, the question is, do they release their nanoparticles? And some other cell picks it up. And so what we did is these are human cells, and we stained them for human antibodies. And that was the way. So we confirmed that the cells that were in the brain with nanoparticles were, in fact, the human cells that we injected. Uh, now, this is minimally invasive uh, or non-invasive at all. Uh, so after the animal gets FUS mediated blood brain barrier opening, uh, they stay under anesthesia and they rest their head. Uh, the Aya Cook wanted us to kind of put a more of a cushion. I think there's a little cushion, but that's a rodent just resting its head on a really large refrigerator magnet, a uh, three by three neodymium cylinder. And then, courtesy of Mark Lithgow, he gave us in England, he gave us what's called a whole back array. A whole back array is an arrangement of, of of magnets. You can actually learn how to make one of these on YouTube. Uh, but it's designed to focus the magnetic flux so that there's less of a decrement for uh, causing magnetic attraction at a distance. Because we all know that the farther you get from magnet, you have a dramatic exponential decline, which is why we need a very large. This thing in full force testing has 800 pounds of pull force. Uh, one of my colleagues suggested that we have a, a, you know, a double one, but we couldn't construct it because we had two of these together 
there's no piece of plastic that would hold together this thing with 1,600 pounds of force that would want to squish the animal's head, you know, into pulp. Uh, and the way we did this experiment is that we knew that it's very hard to do sonication exactly the same way. So uh, the company we worked with was kind enough to make us dummy nanoparticles. They're called CERB, sans iron rhodamine uh, uh, particles. Uh, and they're a different color. So what we had is a mixture of cells that were engulfing the dummy particles. They're totally identical, uh, except they don't have any iron in them, and the other ones. And so the question then is we start out with a mixture of a one-to-one -one mixture. What do we end up with in brain? And the answer is we end up with, depending upon the strength of the magnet, virtually only magnetic particles. And, and it's almost like a dose response. So that's a two by two one, has about 300 full pores. The three by three has uh, 800. And dorsal means close to the magnet. Ventral is deeper, further away. And so even with the, uh, the smaller magnet, uh, we got a more of an effect closer to the magnet, as you expect, less of an effect deeper. But that starts to fade away, as you would expect, as we crank up the uh, power of the magnet. So what are we going to do now? Uh, well, we actually got funded to now test this in an animal model of Parkinson's. Can we deliver enough dopaminergic cells to reverse an animal model of Parkinson's? Uh, you know, and also one, one of Victor's favorite issues, again, I, nobody understands how these cells get in there. As I said, I, it seems impossible to me that a 10 micron cell can then get into the brain through a transient one micron opening but maybe they're attracted for it. And the other aspect is we'd like to continue uh, some of the intranasal work. All the intranasal work so far has sonicated brain. I'm really curious, and I actually have uh, IACUC approval, since it's pretty benign, to sonicate the nose. Because as I mentioned, there's a nose brain barrier, which also includes uh, tight junctions between nasal epithelium. And frankly, uh, I would personally rather have my nose sonicated from a safety reason than my brain sonicated. Because if you oversonicate brain, you get hemorrhage. If you oversonicate nose, you, get it, you might get a bloody nose. Uh, and of course, unlike brain, the nasal epithelium regenerates. So that's what we're also focusing on in the future. And uh, as you can tell, I've been having an awful lot of fun the last three years uh, with this. And part of it is in being involved, you know, everybody talks about interdisciplinary work. And this is walking the walk. And it is so much fun dealing with people with all these different expertise. Uh, Dr. Frankel, who is an ultrasound expert, the head of our research radiology group is Dr. Gulapali. None of this would have happened without Elias Mellum, who is our chair of radiology and a neuroradiologist who got us the, the machine, uh, the uh, Insight Tech people. It's been a rare pleasure for me to actually have clinical work and research work that actually have something to do with each other. It's, it's been a rare phenomenon. And again, my colleagues, Dr. Urowski and Shen, three of the neurosurgeons, so, uh, and multiple funding agencies as well. And I really, like I said, it, we're one of these rare situations where we have both an animal device and a human clinical device. And... Uh, in spite of the fact that I, uh, I was given an hour and something, I actually went over. But I'm, I think I have enough time for questions. I'm happy to take questions. All right. Thank you, Paul. And we do have a couple of questions, it looks like, from our online group. The first is, does it make sense, the approach of using low-intensity focused ultrasound to open the blood-brain barrier at the substantia nigra to deliver the anti-alpha anti synuclein drugs? Well, the answer is uh, partially yes. And there's always been a controversy about what the target should be. Is it the nigra or the striatum? And that's been a problem in gene therapy. Uh, and because, again, uh, alpha-synuclein has a lot of its toxicity at its terminals. So I would say you'd probably want to hit both. You'd probably want to deliver it to nigra, but you probably want to deliver it uh, you know, to the striatum, where a lot of it is. The sin in synuclein 
uh, the, the nuke is actually a misrepresentation, is that it's synaptically located. And the synapses are in the striatum. In a human, that's a good inch or so away. But both are probably going to be important. Okay. Next question. When you say scanning ultrasound, do you mean regular imaging ultrasound or using the focused ultrasound at a very low energy level, perhaps in a defocused way? Uh, well, it's actually... Uh, kind of in between. It is, in fact, focus ultrasound, and it is at an intensity, but it's just the system that they've developed. They call it scanning ultrasound, but they're really just taking that spot of ultrasound and moving it uh, in a systematic way across the tissue so that they can cover a large amount of tissue, which you would have to in Alzheimer's disease. So it's kind of the, their own term uh, from the Australian group. Right. Beating everybody into submission. Okay. Uh, so thank you uh, for that very nice talk. Um, I have a, one question. You said you, you would like maybe to sonicate through the nose. So how are you going to deal with the air uh, interface? So are you going to fill the nose with some water? Oh, yeah. That's, that's the easiest part. Uh, actually, it's even done clinically in some countries as a treatment for allergic rhinitis. So you can take even ultrasound gel, put it in uh, into a nostril, uh, and, and do it. It's, it's already been done clinically. The, the scaling down uh, is probably going to be harder than the scaling up. So you're right. Uh, uh, you can use a liquid. You usually, again, uh, remember, rodents are obligate uh, nose breathers, so you only can do one nostril at a time, but then you clear it out and do the other nostril. Okay, another question from online. Are there any ongoing approaches of transmitting ultrasound through the ear, again, as a method of avoiding the skull? Uh, not that I know of, and I think it would be really technically difficult to do uh, because uh, the, the ear has plenty of skull. Uh, it's not like the ear goes directly into it, and if anything, there are so many sensitive things. I would say that right now, one of the commonest transient people, uh, symptoms that people get that's transient is they get nausea and they get a sense of movement like or vertical moving. And so the question is, is that because, remember, there is calcium inside the ear, physiologic, inside the labyrinth and the semicircular canals. And so I think if you put ultrasound tag in the ear, you would probably make somebody horrendously nauseous, you know, by doing that mentioned that um, these other methods that are out there, there's such a low percentage of the stem cells that are actually delivered where you want them to be delivered. What do you think would be a clinically significant percentage, or is that something still to be determined? Well, it's, there are two things. Percentage relates most to safety. Absolute numbers within brain are related to the clinical effect. So the answer is if you have something that's safe, uh, the low efficiency isn't a problem. You know, as I mentioned, uh, the approach in these things has been mostly so far with lysosomal storage diseases, where the protein is FDA approved as a treatment, and even if half a percent gets in, if enough gets in to relieve neurologic symptoms, so what? Because the rest of the protein is going to a place where it's going to be beneficial and not harmful. So it's more, so ratio relates more to safety, absolute numbers, but also in place, but it's really absolute numbers uh, that in the brain that relate to clinical effect. Okay, there's another question that just came in. So for Parkinson's, what would be the ideal envelope size to diffuse an agent using focused ultrasound induced blood brain barrier opening? Would it be the whole brain or only around the thalamus region? Um, we know we have a lot of limitations where we can truly focus ultrasound in the brain because of the skull barrier. So there is a limitation on treatment envelope size. Sure. It would depend on the stage of Parkinson's. And again, uh, that first question was like this. You probably want to treat 
uh, the Nigro Strait area, which would be the most straightforward because, again, it's close to the center of it. Uh, it allows for it. Uh, in more advanced, the real issue is, that, as I mentioned, more advanced Parkinson's disease has a dementing illness, and now you start to see selenuclein. So you would have to have an Alzheimer-like approach treating a large uh, volume of brain if you were now ask, act after dementia-like symptoms of late Parkinson's. One more. You talked about the, uh, the process being a, a work in progress as, as people gain experience treating patients with focused ultrasound. If you're an average patient out there who, who has essential tremor or Parkinson's disease, is, how close are we to the time when those patients say, okay, now I want to get on board, now I want to be treated, but we've had enough experience in treating patients that now I want to get care? Well, I think for essential tremor, the time is now. Uh, remember, uh, and, and again, it's, it's, it's numbers. I mean, the FDA wouldn't have granted uh, approval if they didn't think we were there. Because when I said there's 700 patients worldwide, uh, the vast majority have been essential tremor. Uh, so I'd say Parkinson's is still a work in progress. Uh, essential tremor, we were talking about some of those early studies, but now, uh, now that we're seeing pivotal studies, with 70, I think there's 76 patients in the pivotal studies. But again, I think it's going to be also center specific. And the question is, like any technique, is what training, and uh, I would hope that as new centers come online, and, and they've been good, that new centers come online, just like with DBS. Uh, you go and do, uh, when we started our DBS program, uh, we did the tour, which means I did site visits to New York, to Emory, uh, to San Francisco, to Philadelphia, and watch them do DBS so that we could hit the ground running. And so uh, I would hope that as people launch new centers, they do the tour and, and get as much information from the existing centers, which we'll be happy to give. How long will the blood-brain barrier remain open? Uh, we're talking about a few hours, and probably the closure of it is exponential. Uh, so that it's pretty wide open over the first hour or two, you know, by probably, depending upon the amount of energy, but by six hours, 90% closed, by a day, it's, it's back. Uh, so uh, when we do our experiments, it's like as soon as they're sonicated, uh, you know, and, and we can get away from the MRI, you know, having a, uh, a three-inch magnet near an MRI, it's not a good thing. So as soon as that's done, we, we put our magnet on. All right. I think we've covered all the questions. So this concludes today's webinar. Thanks again to Dr. Fishman, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Stay tuned to our newsletter and our website for invitations to future webinars. Thank you.